What if you could assemble your French cleat tool holders without using screws, nails, or even glue? What if you could assemble them tool free? After messing around with glue and brad nails, I thought to myself, there's gotta be a better way. So I did some modeling and I've come up with a set of eight tool holders, which in theory at least will fit together just using friction. Follow along with me to see how to make them. And I will share a bunch of tips and tricks along the way. You can also build these for yourself using the cut files in the description. Oh, and for any woodworking content creators, stick around to the end for a cleat idea just for you. This first fitting is a bit of a cheat, as strictly speaking, there is no assembly needed. But I thought to include it as it's pretty useful and I can use it to recap some of the fundamentals that I talked about in my previous cleat fitting video. If you have a miter gauge, you may be asking yourself, what do I do with it when I'm not using it on my saw? Well, we can easily solve this storage problem with a pair of cleat brackets like these. All you need to do is place the brackets on the wall and then hook on your miter gauge. Definitely not going anywhere. To make these brackets and all of the self-assembly parts we're gonna look at, you will need a CNC router or a laser. Personally, I'm using Shape Origin and we'll show you the method I use with our next more substantial tool holder. If your shop is anything like mine, you'll likely have a load of different fasteners and other hardware boxed up in various dark corners. Well, with this next fitting, we'll hopefully reduce some of that lost time trying to find the screws that you bought a few weeks back. The idea is to combine a set of cleat brackets with a bottom front and back insert to create a small fastener tray. We can then add further trays in a series to make a modular set as long as we need. Let's cut the pieces out and then come back and see how we do the self-assembly. For the CMC cutouts, I'm using 50 millimeter birch ply which I fix with double-sided tape to a nine mm MDF spoil board. I then have a matching piece of MDF, the same width as my bench, which has shape of reference tape already applied. This gets fixed in place with a couple of clamps. I like to leave around 20 mm gap between my cut piece and the reference board. This way I can place cut files very close to the edge of the piece and not cut into my reference board. With both boards fixed, I can then refresh the scan on origin and make sure to capture the full outline of the cut piece. I then import my cut files and place optimally to make as much use of the material as possible. You could grid here for more accuracy, but I personally don't as grids require two straight perpendicular sides, which you won't generally have with offcuts. For the cuts themselves, I'm using a six millimeter spiral up cut bit where I do three five millimeter passes using auto pass. On the outside cuts, I don't use any offset as I've designed some offset into the cut file for the mortises that touch the perimeter. For the internal mortises, I recommend using a 0.1 millimeter offset and doing a test fit with your tenon pieces. One tip here is to push a little bit more than pull when cutting across the piece. I found I get more control this way and less jumps. Once the parts are cut, we can do some cleanup. Here I like to do a pass with my eccentric sander on both sides and then follow up with some hand sanding of the edges. The parts for the three fixing trays in series are ready to go. Let's take a close look at them and see how we're going to assemble them. Our bracket pieces have the same cleat hook, back support and locking mechanism as before, but now we also have additional mortise cutouts, which we then pair with matching tenons on our insert pieces. Both the mortise and tenon cuts also have these small notches. These are here so that we can achieve a flush 90 degree joints without needing to chisel out the rounded corners left by the router bit. Parts can now just be push fitted together. If you've kept the offset super tight, then you might need a mallet. Either way, a tight fit is what we're looking for. Once up on the wall, I realized that these trays are a little on the XL side, so I got thinking about making up some dividers. The idea I came up with was to disassemble the parts and cut a shallow single blade width dado in all the inserts. This was a little precarious given that only a single tenon was touching the fence, so I used a sacrificial support piece for better safety. I then modeled the dados in Fusion 360 so I could size up the needed divider. Here I could have used some sheet material, but as I had my 3D printer out for some other parts that we'll see later, I thought to print up some dividers. This worked pretty well, and the resulting size I thought would be ideal to store my dominoes. Labels were a last touch, so that I know what I'm looking at. Now we've got our basic method down, we can start getting creative with how we apply the same principles to different use cases. First up is some multi-level storage for all of my glues. Hero Design uses two tall brackets with mortise cutouts for three tenon shelves. We also have holes bored out for dowels to act as shelf retainers. Cutting the parts follows the same process. Start with the shelves, second is the internal mortises along with a fitment check and offset adjustment if need be. 
Then you can helix cut out for the dowels and again start with a positive offset and gradually increase the size as needed to ensure a tight fit. Finally, you can cut out the large brackets with the inside cuts come first. A good way to think about it is do the inside cuts before the outside cuts. This way, there is no chance that your piece will move during the cutting. Same cleanup as before with assembly taking less than a minute. In the end, I decided to leave out the dowel in the lower shelf for quicker grabs of my glue bots. Battery powered tools are great, but it does mean that you're likely to have a few charges lying around the shop or taking up space in a drawer. For me at least, when I need to charge, the cable is somehow always in the way and basically the whole charge workflow is annoying. So to make things tidy and more efficient, we can make up a simple charging station. In this case, there are two cleat brackets, a shelf and a backboard. Idea being to vertically amount the two charging units to the backboard and then the shelf above to store a few batteries. The shelf also has a secondary benefit of reducing dust buildup within the charge ports. Once assembled, I just needed to add a few wood screws to the backboard to secure the charge stations. To get our screw holes in place, here is a quick tip for you. Take some painter's tape and cover the screw recesses on the rear of the charging stations and mark where the screws need to be positioned. Then transfer the tape onto the backboard and you now know where you need to pre-drill. With the charging station up on the wall, I thought to level up a bit more and 3D print some brackets for my Milwaukee and Festool batteries. This way they won't get knocked off and there will be no buildup of dust on the contact points. I haven't been 3D printing for long, but it's for sure been a game changer for small shop accessories and hacks like this. Let me know in the comments if you would like me to do a more dedicated video on 3D printing for the wood shop. If you're into hand tools, then I'm sure you have a bench plane or perhaps a jack plane like this Veritas one. Maybe you even have a collection going. Cleat holders for planes that I've seen tend to be really bulky and need loads of material and have large wall projection. Instead, I wanna keep the size down and give me modular options for a future collection without needing a total rebuild. The design I came up with is similar to what we've already seen. We have two wall brackets, a back piece, and two small inserts to create a notch for the plane to sit in. The back piece angle is 15 degrees off vertical, so to add some security, we also have a pair of eight millimeter holes bored into the brackets, between which you can string some elastic rope. Once up on the wall and combined with our locking pegs, the plane is secure and definitely not going anywhere. I'm pretty sure every woodworker has a few drills or drivers in their shop. They're a little awkward to store in a space efficient way. Here again, most of the cleat holders I've seen for drills are these massive overbuilt things. And in a bigger shop, these hulking builds might be just fine. In a small shop like mine, I'd rather wanted something leaner. Like with the hardware trays we saw earlier, the idea is to use four wall brackets and three shaped inserts, which use longer tenons for the outside brackets and shorter for the inside. As every drill is sized differently, I thought to do a rough test cut and then check against each drill as expected, I needed to make some adjustments. If you try this drill rack using the SVGs that I've shared in Shaper Hub, then it's possible that you will need to adjust them to fit your own drill. With this in mind, let's quickly jump over to the office and I can show you quickly how you can do these adjustments in Fusion 360. If you aren't gonna use Fusion, feel free to skip to the next chapter. We start in Shaper Hub and having found the right file, download it, then jump over into Fusion 360. Here you can use a menu item to place the SVG anywhere you like. Now I found that SVGs exported from Shaper Hub do not import into Fusion with the correct scale. So before we can make adjustments, we need to fix the scale. To do this, we first need to check what the actual dimension should be. I use Illustrator, but other apps will give you the same result. In Illustrator, I can use the layers property to get millimeter dimensions of the file. In this case, the bracket is 215 millimeters front to back. Back in Fusion, I need to select all of the SVG and unlock it so that it turns blue. Then use the dimension tool to check the front to back length. Here we just need to copy the number by pressing Command or Control C. Select the whole object again and in the Modify menu, select Sketch Scale. This will open up a dialog box. In it, we need to click on Point and then on our sketch, select any point. I usually go with the origin. Then in the scale factor, we type in the target length, in this case 215, and divide using the forward slash key by the value we copied, which we can paste with command or control V. This will also paste in the millimeter unit, so delete the characters and then the expression will turn black. Hit return, 
and you will now have the correct size. You can check again using the dimension tool. Those steps might sound like a lot, but after your first time, it will just take a few seconds. To make adjustments to our sketch, we just need to redraw a few lines. Let's say that our drill is a little bit wider at 48 millimeters instead of 42, and has a longer grip section, so this dimension needs to be 80 millimeters. Here I like to first delete the rounded corner connector lines, and then use the offset tool to make new lines for our width. For the depth, I delete all the old internal lines and draw a new one in the rough position. Then add a constraint to make it parallel with the back line, and use the dimension tool to set our new 80 millimeter depth. Now I just add more right angle lines to connect everything up, and then use the trim tool to remove unwanted lines. Then finally use the fillet tool to add back in the corner radiuses, in this case 20 millimeters. To get this new sketch to an SVG we have two options. First we can exit the sketch and use the Shaper Utilities plugin and option to select the entire sketch, then pick the sketch from our browser. Or if we want to have an encoded depth that we can use with Origin, then we first need to extrude the sketch to create a new body, say 50 millimeters. Now we can use the Shaper Utilities plugin option for a single solid body. With our SVG saved, we can finally head back to Shaper Hub, upload our new file, and then head back to the workshop. Now we have our correctly sized draw rack pieces cut and prepped, we can slot them together and get them up on the wall. As an afterthought, I also printed a couple of chuck holders for my CXS, just to keep these handy. This next one is a little different. If you have routers in the shop, which you definitely will if you're watching this, then you have no doubt got a load of router bits either boxed up or all over the place. Maybe you have some bits in a tray which works nicely when you're using the router, as you can take the tray to the bench when in use. However, what do you do with the tray when it's not in use? Well, I think there's a better way. The plan here is to use a couple of small brackets and a back piece with mortise and tenons as before. However, we're also going to bore a load of holes for magnets. We can then make up blocks to hold bits of different collet sizes, and again use magnets to connect the parts together. To make up the blocks, I cut some ply slightly over target size, and then glued them together. I then evened up one side on the jointer before ripping to target depth on the table saw and then to target width on the mitre saw. For the hole boring, I'm using Shaper Origin and Workstation where I tape the cut pieces to the shelf, do a grid, and then helix cut all of the holes using a cut file that I made up in Fusion. I also thought to use the engraving bit to label the front of the blocks according to the collet size. Last step was to fix the magnets. Here I use a dab of CA glue in the pocket and a spray of activator on the magnet. Just make sure that the magnets are all facing the right way. With the parts ready, I loaded up all my bits for a test. The smaller bits felt pretty secure with just the magnets. However, with all three trays together and on the back piece, the weight was just too much despite the 27 magnet pairs. My first thought here was to completely abandon this holder, but then I got the idea to switch up the brackets and fit a small shelf piece to partially support the big cutter block. This way it's secure and I can still grab the trays and take them to the bench. The fitting's now been up overnight and nothing has fallen down, so I'm gonna call that an eventual success. Now let's talk about saws. Storing saws is a pain. Up until this point, I've been storing all my pull saws in a bag where the teeth just catch every time I wanna take one out. So I wanted to design a cleat fitting and see if we can make it work using the same no glue, no fixing method. The design I came up with involves a load of small parts to make up a row of compartments where we will use a piece of dowel to grab the saw as we slot in. Now, while this is not a new approach, the examples I've seen involve loads of glue and pins. They also aren't modular, meaning that you cannot extend to add another saw when you want to add to your collection. With the parts eventually cut, I thought to do a test with the first compartment to see if it grabs the saw. Unfortunately, it was a total failure. Didn't hold the saw at all, complete disaster. After cooling off for a few minutes, I wondered if increasing the angle of the internal insert would make a difference. So with a few scrap pieces glued together, I tested increasing the angle from 50 degrees to 75 degrees. Thankfully this now worked and as a result, I just needed to make up a new back piece and front piece and then finally put all the parts together. This was fairly tricky with tight tolerances, but using a mallet for some persuasion, I eventually got them together. Although there was some trauma to get it right, the outcome works pretty nicely. And I've got a couple of spare slots for the dovetail and fret saws that I'm hopefully gonna get very soon. Now it's bonus time for the woodworking content creators. If you're filming in your shop, you will know that as we head into the darker months, there is less natural light to fill in your shots. 
This means more reliance on fixed lighting, and that means more lighting stands getting in your way, which as we all know, are tedious to move around. If only I had a pound or dollar for every time I've tripped over one. If you're nodding your head, then here is a solution. We have a small shelf, which I've fitted with a light stand arm, and then combined with a small LED light panel. Works great and can be mains or battery powered. To make these up, you just need to counterbore a small shelf piece and pair together with a couple of cleat brackets. Super simple and quick to make, and now the light stands can go back in the bag.